Welcome to the Global Connection, a Tel Aviv University podcast. Journey with us as we discover how TAU's academic community and friends are engaging with and helping to shape this ever-changing world. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Global Connection. Um, I'm happy to have in the studio with me today Dr. Yara Oren, a cancer researcher from the Department of Human Molecular Genetics and Biochemistry in the Faculty of Medicine here at TAU. Her lab, which focuses on reimagining cancer therapy by researching a population of cancer cells known as persistent cells, is funded in partnership with the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program with support from the Israeli Foundation, the Israel Science Foundation, the Israel Cancer Research Fund, and the European Research Council. Previously, Dr. Oren was a postdoctoral fellow at the Broad Institute and Harvard Medical School. Yara joins me today as she is a very recent recipient of the prestigious European Research Council grant for young researchers. Welcome, Yara. Thank you for joining me. Really excited to be here this morning. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, I have, so question number one actually came from researching your wonderful website a little bit where you had a secret hobby um, listed on there, and that is that you like talking or sparking conversation with strangers on buses. So tell me about that. Yes. So I'm a very curious person and I am fortunate to have uh, to commute every day by bus to the university. And I have this amazing opportunity to talk to people. It's not necessarily on the bus. Um, Even if you sit next to me in the playground, which I spend a lot of time in, uh, I will likely start talking to you. And I I learned really interesting things while doing that. Do you have a natural opener? Uh, No, it's really kind of situation based. Uh, But people really like talking about themselves. So it's quite easy. Okay. Okay, I you feel, should try it. It's fun. I, I should. I should. Um, I feel like it's probably helpful for in the lab too, right? Yeah, like sure. you probably have a, a a great personality for just sort of making people feel at home and that type of thing. If that's your talent, I well, would say. that you should ask my students, not me. <laughs> okay, but I, I I hope they're having fun. Fair, fair, fair. <laughs> Um, Okay, so I have to ask you how you became interested in cancer research. Yeah, so uh, for a long time, I actually tried to avoid uh, cancer research. So I was raised in a house of scientists. And uh, I always thought that being a scientist is like the most amazing job because you basically get to do your hobby and travel a lot and meet interesting people and talk to them, which I love. Um, But uh, I tried to stay away of cancer research because that's... uh, the field of uh, my father. And then, you know, after fighting that for a long time, I said, well, if you really like it, then you should pursue it. Um, And that's how I ended studying cancer research. But my background is quite unusual. So I'm a microbiologist by training. Okay. And um, I kind of like to bridge, to bring together these worlds as someone who was trained as a microbiologist and is relatively new to cancer research and to think how we can think of uh, new ways to think of problems that have been unfortunately with us for many, many years. Okay. I, I have to follow up on that. How do you, how can you bring together microbiology and cancer research? Yeah. So the, the field that I'm studying um, is actually based, deeply based in microbiologists. So this concept that there are cells that should die based on all our textbooks, but from some reason survive um, without any uh, obvious uh, reason. Um, has been studying in microbiology for more than 80 years, this concept of persister cells. Um, And it was discovered in cancer cells uh, about 13 years ago. So we just say we celebrated our bar mitzvah and we're very excited. We're a young field. Um, And so for me, it was quite natural to say, look, there is this, 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 this thing that we've been studying as a community for a long time in microbiology. Let's think how we can apply all this knowledge to uh, cancer research. Okay. Okay. So you knew, well, you were working in microbiology, but when it came time where you started to shift towards cancer research, you kind of went into that research knowing exactly what you wanted to work on. Yes. So I, uh, so it's a, it's a funny story. So when I was, um, during my PhD and I was studying microbiology, I was fortunate to go to a conference in Dublin 
and um, and I keep kosher, and they mix the food. So we accidentally got like bacon, which was clearly not kosher. So we, I went to the place where they uh, to talk to the organizers, and then came other people who also didn't get the food they wanted. And I met their uh, colleague that is now a, a faculty in the Technion, and he said, um, and I told him, "What are you doing here?" Because you know what, we usually I I I, I don't see him in conferences, and he said. Um, you know, there is all this thing happening in, in cancer biology where where it looks like the, the things that we've been studying for a long time in microbiology, they now they're relevant. Um, and, and that's the first time where, where it kind of clicked. And I was like, you know, it might be interesting to think how we could apply um, the, 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 the kind of deep foundation that we have in microbiology. Um, so yes, I always remind it to him, um, that he's he, in a reason, in, in many ways, he's the, he, uh, he's the spark that he's made me spark. do he's this transition. Spark. Right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the field is about, uh, 13 years old. Um, so studying persistent cells, um, for you, then when you began this research, what was that? 13 years ago? Was it more recently? Like how big of a field was there when you when you started doing that research? Yeah, so I uh, really made the transition from microbiology to cancer research during my postdoc. Um, um, and uh, I was very fortunate to have the support of my two amazing mentors, uh, Joan Brugge and Aviv Regev, who um, took me in because I knew nothing about cancer research. I didn't know anything. I didn't know any of the techniques. Um, and I just told them, you know, I think it's interesting. And they they had faith in me and also uh, were willing to give me the ability to acquire these new skills. And back then, it was a very controversial, um, so we we're talking about eight years ago, it was a very controversial field because many of the, uh, many people believed that it, it's not trivial to translate what we see in bacteria to cancer cells. And there might not be a, I would say a therapeutic avenue to follow. Um, and I am happy to say that uh, in these eight years, I think there was a shift. So there is now more and more understanding that we have been overlooking uh, these cells for a long time and they might be, uh, they might, hold the key to uh, new therapies if we were able to target them. Uh, so we are a very uh, young community uh, in the persister field, and we all know each other, and it's really fun, um, you know, uh, either in conferences or even, uh, you know, some Zoom meetings where I'll, 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 I'll uh, ask a colleague, I'm like stuck, can you help me? So um, it's it's a small field, but it's uh, it's growing, and I'm, I'm happy to say there are also now, there is also a lot of interest, not only from academia, but also from pharma to say, you know, maybe you can help us understand what's going on there so okay. we could develop okay. drugs. Okay. Now, when I think of cancer research, um, it's probably one of the most global fields just in terms of their, you know, a huge amount of interest and resources around the world. Um, so do you, do you feel like it's very much a global community um, for persister research? Um, are there particular universities that you're working with more than others? Or Yeah, so one of the beauties of working in a very young field is that the, it, the knowledge is not kept in a single university. So I think we're still at the phase where we are all equal and we are all working together to build the foundations of what we hope will be in a in the years to come, uh, an established field of knowledge. Um, so, you know, I have am amazing colleagues in Belgium and in the U.S. and in uh, in Spain. And I, I would say that uh, we are all really working together. And I think this is quite unique to our fields, really working together in order to try to solve this mystery. Okay. What does a what does a day to day life look like for you in the in the lab? Yeah. So. Um, I think uh, our lab uh, combines is is um, belongs to the the labs that combine both computational and experimental work. Um, so we uh, have people that are working both on the computational aspects of how can we study this phenomena, and the people who are pipetting and doing the the what we call bench work. Um, and what I love about that is that um, we they all they come from very different um, they think of 
problems very differently, and they all communicate to try to try to advance the research. So uh, I love the interaction, this kind of inter interdisciplinary interaction within the lab. And in order to make it really good, we also have a lot of chocolate and cookies in the lab. Okay. So that Very to encourage important. happiness mm -hmm. um, in our lab. So uh, if you're ever anyone who wants to come and visit, we have our secret a stash and it's quite big. Okay. And we're happy to okay. share it. Okay. <laughs> Secret ingredient in cancer research. Exactly. Then. A lot of chocolate. Yeah. 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 Um, so can you talk about the potential applications of your research a bit? You, you have sort of elaborated on the significance um, of looking at persister cells, but but maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more. That would yeah. Be great. So maybe I think uh, the best way to uh, explain it is by an example. So uh, unfortunately, f for cancer today, the measurement of success is not by curing. We we can cure um, we can cure various infections. If you have COVID, you are likely cured. Putting aside long COVID effects, the issue with cancer is that too often do we see that it comes back, and that's why today in the clinic, cancer is not measured. Um, the success in treatment is not measured in cure, but rather in 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 this five year survival mark. Would you survive five years from initial di diagnosis? And the, the 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 problem is this is that conceptually we're very good at initially killing cancer cells, and that's why most patients, and it's important to say may, most patients today would respond to therapy and would go home to their families. But a lot of times we see that cancer does come back, and when it comes back, it's very hard to treat it. So we know now that there is a phase where these there are cancer cells, but they're not causing an active disease. Um, and we know that in many cases, these cancer cells they behave differently than the full-blown cancer that we know to treat. Um, and and our, our, our um, research tries to understand what is special about these cells when they're in that state. Um, and for many patients, we don't treat them because we can, because these persister cells, they're not responding to the therapy we're giving the patients. Um, and, and we are trying to think of ways where instead of sending that patient home and telling them, you know, we really hope that it won't come back. But knowing that in many, let's say in ovarian cancer, 50% of the patients would recur. But we're not giving them anything because we can't. But think of a world where we where we had a way to kill these cells. So instead of saying, okay, we can't give you anything, we just wait, maybe we can do something. Um, and there are um, examples today to give ovarian cancer, so uh, where you could give a non relatively non toxic therapy that the patients can take as a pill every day, and that would you know keep cancer at bay. So, uh, but in order to be able to design this pill, we need to understand what is happening in these cells, and for a long time we've just ignored it. Like for the the data, the knowledge we have built is for these initial treatment and when we see it coming back. But we are trying to understand what is happening in these uh, rare cells. Okay, okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, it for me, it, and I think for a lot of people, it sounds like really important research um, related to cancer. Can you position it a little bit in terms of some of the other broader research trends in cancer, what, what people are focusing on, elsewhere and, and maybe how they kind of all work together too. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the, I would say, if you look at the biggest um, changes in the way we treat cancer therapy in the last 30 years, I would say there are two types of therapies that really have shifted uh, the way we think and we treat cancer. One is um, targeted therapy, and this is this concept that you could based on the composition of the tumor of each individual, you can fit a drug that specifically kills the tumor cells. Because this is the hard thing about killing tumor cells is that they're from the, our own body, right? It's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, it's a part of us. So how do you find a drug that kills only that part of us and not the rest? Um, so targeted therapy has really changed um, the lives of many, many people and save the lives of many people. And that's that concept that today we can 
based on known, it's called mutations, no changes in the tumor. You can have a drug, again, not toxic, that you can take every day for many years um, that would kill only the cancer cells. Uh, so that's, I would say, one side. And the other side that is more recent, a recent is the... Um, uh, is what is called immunotherapy. So how can we harness the cells in our body to attack the cancer cells? Um, and I think these, uh, if you, you look from a therapeutic perspective, these are two um, topics that started as a very, very basic research and have completely shifted the way we treat patients. And uh, where we where we kind of situate ourselves is... Um, trying to understand for these therapies, um, even if they work initially, why do they ultimately fail? So, um, so we are very much interested in understanding how these, there is much work on understanding how these initial therapies work and why they work and we know they work. Um, and we're really focusing on understanding why do they ultimately fail? Um, and, 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 and I would say one of the really amazing things at Tel Aviv University and in our faculty of medicine is that we have people that are studying, uh, the, what is called the immunology, how we can, uh, how we can harness our own cells to attack the cancer cells and also the more kind of, uh, what is called signal transduction in the context of targeted therapy. And it's fun that I have the ability to interact with them and drink coffee with them on a daily basis. Uh, basis and brainstorm ideas. So I think that's really one of the unique things about uh, being in Tel Aviv University is I have this access to all these great minds. Right, right, right. Um, so I believe you're saying it's been about eight years that you've been focused on cancer research. Um, so even during that time, how would you say the field of cancer research has evolved? Have you seen significant changes and, you know, advancements during that time? Yeah, so I think there are two kind of things that really change how scientists, uh, what kind of work we do. One is technological advances. Um, and, you know, in the kind of research I'm done, I'm doing, because it's focused on a very rare population of cells than the emergence of single cell techniques. So this is our ability now to say something about a single cell in our body, which is amazing, right? Because we have many, many cells. So the ability to, to, to take a single cell and then be able to say, you know, why it behaves in a certain way um, has been instrumental. And we are um, a part of the community that tries to develop techniques to use the single cell approaches to, to ask new things about cancer. So this is definitely something that is single cell sequencing. The first uh, proof of concept was around 2014. So it's also, and from, you know, doing something in the lab on, I believe it was eight cells, um, a ballpark, to now, you know, going into patient data and, and, and sequencing it, which is something we can, can be done today as the clinic is amazing in less than a decade. Um, and the other thing is, a, I would say, a conceptual shift, right? So as scientists, we choose what we work on. And you always need to believe in what you're working on, because if you're a scientist, you're working on questions that weren't solved yet, right? Because otherwise, you won't be working on them. So I think for me, what I, I'm, I'm amazed of how these concepts of like um, non-genetic resistance that have been mocked, really mocked, eight years ago, now they're like, Oh, it's like textbook, right? So there is, I think, um, you need to believe in something and then you can develop techniques and then you can have more proof that you're not not wrong. Okay. So this is kind of technology and conceptual. Okay, okay. At the same time, I think, you know, for me, um, cancer is in my family, it's in so many families. And because of um, the journey of... Of, of fighting cancer, um, I think people are willing to sort of try anything and be a bit more experimental. Um, and, you know, there, there can be advantages to that, but there can be a risk as right. well. Um, so for you, are there some like dominant misperceptions out there in terms of cancer treatments that um, really you, you've paid attention to and maybe you'd, you'd like to share um, 
you know, um, your, your thoughts on them? Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I think that because of this issue that today we have this problem that we we can't say that someone was cured, then, of course, there are many different things that people try. And I would, of course, do, you know, it's, it's a very challenging situation to be in uh, emotionally, to be in this state where of uncertainty for, for a long time, for some patients for many years, this uncertainty. Um, so I think that there are different approaches that are now um, going into, uh, that, that we see in cancer, that again, if you were to think about them five years ago, people would say, oh, that's like witchcraft, right? So um, so my husband is also a faculty in Barilan, and he studies um, this effect of uh, microbes on our body. And the, the, the concept that you can maybe think of changing the microbe composition in order to have to fight cancer better. And, you know, 10 years ago it was science fiction. So I think we need to be very, very careful about saying, you know, this is not going to work. But on the other hand, I, I think that for me, as someone who's doing basic research, I also have the obligation to tell pe people that there is a long, long road between seeing something in a dish or in a mouse to being able to deliver it to patients. And and I think that a lot of times, and we're also, I'm also to blame as a, as a community, you know, the cancer research is saying, oh, you know, we cured these mice. So we have this joke that, you know, mice are, are cured from cancer, right? So as a community, we right. cured cancer, we just did it in mice. Right. But, right. but I think right. we should, we, sh we should, I would, if someone, if someone were to tell me, you know, this, this might be a solution, I would be very hesitant to tell them this is not true. But on the other hand, I think that the, the treatments we offer our patients now are things that are proved, that we know that are robust. And anything else, you know, time will tell if it's going to work or not. Uh, but I think that the, the, there is a very, really emotional challenge in, in, in for, a, for, for, a, for a cancer, for a patient because of this unknown where, where you know, the doctors, they just, they don't know. Mm -hmm. They're sharing all the information they have, right? But they mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they do know that there are these cells in there. So I... I think it's a it's a very the limbo is 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 challenging, um, but I I I I do think that you know if you just look at the numbers, we're getting better at it both at the initial treatment and also of giving the patients information of where exactly do they stand. Okay, okay. Um, for you, what would you say is the most exciting part of your research right now? What are you most excited about? Uh, well, I'm very easily excited about research. Um, so uh, one of the things that my lab is now um, looking at is, um, is focused on is understanding if there are persister traits that we not only don't have targets for, but also didn't uh, drugs for also we never thought that we could target them. So I would give you an example. So one of the things that have been known for a long time is that patients, um, if you give them a therapy and then you give them a drug holiday, meaning you withdraw them from ter therapy, there are patients who then will start responding again if you give the therapy again, the therapy rechallenge. Um, and there is like this, it's unknown what is happening. Like why does drug holiday work? Like, why? Why? What does it matter? Um, what's happening there? And um, and maybe, you know, if we could somehow make all cancer responsive to this holiday, like to this drug holiday. So one of the avenues that our lab is pursuing is thinking of, can we uh, think of drugs that erase cancer cell memories so that they would forget that they were treated and then respond again. Because as I said, initial therapy works very well in the vast majority of patients. So if we had a way to make cancer cells think it's the first time, they will die. Um, so um, this is, again, very basic. From this to a real drug, a long road. But I think that's one of the things I'm excited about, right? Thinking of a completely new class of drug um, that might make our patients 
uh, responsive. Okay. Um, the, the European Research Council grant, um, is it related particularly to this question? Is it a bit of a different question you're trying to pursue? Uh, so this is one of the questions. So the European Council uh, grant is a big grant, um, and, it's, uh, and it, it funds um, different questions in my lab. But I think what it, what it, the, the common thing about all these questions is, is, is trying to think persister specific like we know that for many years we tried to use the drugs we have been using for initial therapy on persister cells and you're bombing them and nothing happens like nothing happens so our approach is saying okay let's let's you know clean slate we are starting with persisters what are, what is important for persisters we don't have the techniques no problem. We'll build the techniques. We don't have the computational tools. We'll build the computational tools. But we're not trying to apply the tools that were developed for studying um, this, this what is called mutations. We're, we are really focused on persister cells. And so, you know, memory is one aspect. They have um, ability to uh, kind of switch from cells that are not growing to cells that are growing. And of course, from a patient perspective, this cells are growing, it's problematic. So we're trying to understand if there is a way to specifically target this reawakening um, and, 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 and looking at this time, right? Can we maybe, even if we can't kill them, can we make them sleep a bit longer? Because I think that would be good also. So, so the, 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 the grant tries to, gives us the support to, to dare to do these things, right? Because it's risky. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we don't have the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But we are very lucky that they uh, are willing to fund our um, endeavor to try to, to try to. So if you, you know, interview me in five years, I would say, you know, here, these are memory raising drugs for cancer cells. Right, right, right. Um, so my next question, I feel like I'm still stuck in the wrong paradigm of thinking <laughs> because you, you did kind of correct this earlier. Um, so it was going to be, you know, when do you think we'll see a cure for cancer? But maybe that's the wrong question. So maybe I'll get you to correct that question a little bit. Like, what what is when we're thinking about the future horizon of um, cancer treatments? What should we be thinking about, and what what is the ultimate goal that you think researchers are are trying to get to? Yeah. So of course, cure is amazing. Uh, but I think if you look at which therapies were the most successful, these were the ones that were able to keep cancer at bay. So we have now therapies for breast cancer patients. Again, a pill, you take it daily. It has very minimal side effects. And you know that you're, as long as you take it, you're good. So for me, um, I am a bigger believer in making it of a chronic disease. And if you think of a uh, cancer onset as something that usually happens later in life um, and when you're 60 or six, 60 or 70 then that's if I can extend your lifespan by 30 years I'm probably good now of course there are cancer it would be amazing to 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 be able to really cure cancer but uh, I think that if we were able to provide these pills that again do exist um, then that would also be an amazing right Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Yara, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and learning about your research and, and what's happening more broadly in cancer research. Thank you for Thank joining you. me Thank today. Thank you for having me.